Hello everyone and welcome back to International Space Station Assembly with Realism Overhaul in Kerbal Space Program. We are launching here STS-122, the Space Shuttle Atlantis, bringing the Columbus Lab to the International Space Station. And I haven't posted a video in this series in about three months, so let me just go through the basics. This is Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1, and the reason for that is that the modules that I'm using for the International Space Station, the mod that I'm using, uh, doesn't seem to appear correct in 1.8.1. The shaders don't work, and so this is the best version to get everything working properly. I've tried to bring it to 1.8.1, but that didn't work. Actually, this series started out in 1.1.3 three years ago on July 4th, 2017, and it's been a long haul, but I have finally completed it. All this was done during live streams, and I have already completed live streams as of recording this voiceover for this episode, so I know that I have finished it. So I'll bring you all the rest of the launches and the completed station, I can promise you that. So I'll have three shuttle launches in this video, and soon after I will edit the subsequent videos. Each shuttle mission is about three hours long, so it's a lot of editing, but anyway. Uh, here we go. The shuttle is separated from the external tank. I do put little separatrons on the external tank to simplify that. The launches are controlled by KOS. As you can see, it's a launch script that I created. And also the re-entry, except for the landing, is handled by KOS as well. I handled the final phase. During the missions in this video, I was having a little bit of trouble with the re-entry script, and I've since fixed that, so in the very last few missions with the shuttle, uh, we will have that fixed and uh, be properly landing at Cape Canaveral at the KSC. So here we go, lining up with the space station and everything. Another little quirk about this is that neither SAS nor Smart ASS can hold the shuttle steady if I control from the docking port, and I don't know why. Uh, but it is just a fact of how this works. So. I control from the cockpit during docking, so normally during the live streams I am turning the camera quite a lot to make sure I'm approaching properly, but here we are. So Columbus Lab this time, and then the next mission, STS-123, will bring up the Experiment Logistics module, and then STS-124 will bring up the key main Kibo module, the Gem Pressurized module, so we'll see those. So here we are approaching to dock very, very carefully. One of the problems is that the space shuttle's thrusters, of course, are basically imbalanced. They're not uh, fully balanced around the docking port. And so anytime you try and translate a little bit, it sort of rotates you somewhat too. Of course, having Smart ASS able to do kill rotation helps in this case. And rotations can also translate you. The docking ports also don't have a whole lot of magnetism. But there we go. All right. At the beginning of this series, I used the canned arm to place the modules. That took a long time. But we got to the point where I would have to use both canned arms, the one on the space shuttle as well as the one on the station, and hand the modules off and uh, sometimes move the canned arm to from place to place. And I decided to just use tugs. Now, in this case, uh, it was probably better that I did use a tug bit because the module, the Columbus Lab here, uh, popped out of the cargo bay at high velocity. It's good that we docked the shuttle uh, in this direction because there's nothing facing the cargo bay here. And so when it sort of popped out, probably because of a collider issue, uh, we did not rip apart the space station or anything. So, thankful for that, and of course, since we weren't relying on canned arm and instead we have these little tugs to work with, uh, I was able to slow it down and send tug number two also to help, and bring the module back. But yeah, uh, eventually it got a little bit tedious. We will eventually see uh, use of canned arm again in this series, and that's when I put beam on, because after that the shuttle is uh, retired, and I don't... I have not decided whether I ever want to use the tugs again without the shuttle. So there we'll be using Canada Arm 2, the one on the space station, in order to place the beam module. Okay, so here we are, bringing the Columbus Lab into its berth. 
And part of my motivation for getting this done now, of course, is with uh, Demonstration Mission 2, the first launch of astronauts uh, with a US rocket in a long time since the last shuttle mission. So I will look forward to duplicating that mission with a completed International Space Station for it to visit. Anyway, so the tug's job is done. This was a relatively simple mission, just putting the Columbus module there. And the tugs are back in the bay and we depart. We have plenty of fuel. And this is the re-entry burn. It does have to get into a standby orbit. I have to time things pretty well to make sure that we're lined up with Cape Canaveral again. Because the station's orbit is a little bit different. It's not... It'd be easy if the station was at a one and a half hour orbit or something, but then it'd be very difficult to phase with it. Uh, yeah, timing is important. You'll notice that I'm on fine controls here, and that's because I generally don't want KOS to wiggle around so much. You, you can see it's sort of trying to wiggle, but uh, having it on fine controls uh, saves the fuel and makes sure that we don't have to reserve too much fuel for re-entry. But at a certain point in re-entry, I need to turn it off of fine controls, and that's usually at around 74 kilometers. You can see it's maxed out yaw here, and I was supposed to take it off of fine controls, and I was talking to the Twitch chat too much, and forgot to do that in time, and there I'd take it off of fine controls, but it's already deviated way too much. So, What's going to happen is we're going to end up catching way too much drag because if it's deviating from the course, it's basically like an S turn, and except it's a far more violent S turn <laughs> in this case. It can couldn't quite recover back there, and that means that it's going to uh, create more drag and it'll fall short of Cape Canaveral or fall short of all of Florida actually. So that is a problem. The script is still trying to get it to the right location. We're right there, as you can see. That's a reasonable path to Cape Canaveral, but we've got other problems. It sort of got in the right position now. It finally caught itself after a lot of maneuvering. But again, we created a lot of drag along the way. And then I have a problem with the re-entry script. I only realized this uh, mainly thanks to the SSTO construction. Uh, we pitched down because in 1.1.3 it needed to at that point. At about 45 kilometers it'd go out of control if it didn't pitch down and basically stall out. In this version though, in 1.3.1, that's too early to pitch down. And I didn't realize that. But basically what's happened is uh, we're pitching down so early that we're going very fast. And the faster you go at lower altitudes, when I say lower altitudes, about 20-30 kilometers, the bigger the vertical stabilizer you need. And the shuttle just didn't have enough of a vertical stabilizer. What we needed to do was hold pitch up for longer, like till 37 kilometers, and then start pitching down. We would have bled more speed like that, and in doing that, we wouldn't have had the yaw problem. So, I eventually figured that out. Uh, here you can see, of course, to recover in that situation, you pitch down, try and find prograde, make sure it's going prograde, and then pull up as soon as you're pretty sure that you've got prograde come along, coming along with you. So that's what I did, and we splashed down in a way that the shuttle can't really do, uh, but we saved our kerbals, so there. Anyway, STS-123 with the Shuttle Endeavour being the Experiment Logistics Module. This is actually the little module on top of Kibo. Uh, Kibo is a sort of a big, very fairly large module on the front side of the space station on the side of Harmony. And this module is the one that sits on top of it. It's a small cylinder right on top of the Kibo module. I think they're collectively called Kibo. But anyway, um, why this goes first I, it is probably some organizational thing. Uh, where STS-124, uh, I think that was Discovery, uh, was probably uh, just not available in time to launch that one first, or something like that, I don't know. Anyway, but this came first and they'll put it in a temporary location, awaiting the main module's arrival, and then it'll be moved to the final location. So here we go, and separation of the external tank. 
and KOS handles the time warp and everything and all the way to making orbit and then hands control over once it's made orbit. And rendezvous have gotten better and better over time. This is a fairly light payload though. So here we go lining up again. And docking. This does have to be done pretty darn precise. Yeah. But over time I have gotten better at it, so that's good. Wish the docking ports would at least give me some credit. <laughs> it's still not quite on yet. There's a little bit of a gap that I have to correct. And there we go. Alright. Now we can get our drones into action. Uh, this time... Uh, no, this is still the same orientation. At least one of the missions I accidentally put it into the wrong orientation. But here we go. This is the... Experiment Logistics Module. And Claw. Incidentally, I tweak sized the Claw down so that they uh, so that the Claw would fit the drones. The drones are still actually a little bit big for, for this purpose. During the streams, we ultimately called them Canada Drones, and I created a Canada Drone. I decided to model one about the same size. And obviously, you still have to put the claw on one end and the docking port at the other. But I put the Canadian flag on, just to make sure. We didn't want to leave Canada out just because we weren't using Canadarm. You can see Canadarm 2 right in the foreground here. It's sort of disjointed. That The fact that it was a little bit iffy like that also made me worried about using it a whole lot. Yeah. Infernal Robotics has always been a little bit iffy. But so far, I mean, nothing crazy has happened. You know, knock on wood and everything. So, here we go. Departing the station. Temporarily placing the module right there. It'll be moved, like I said. And off we go. So after... The next mission will put Kibo on. And then finally, STS-119, which will be in the next video, will put the final solar rays on, the S6 truss. Adding that will make the station look a little bit more complete because right now it seems imbalanced with the two uh, solar trusses on one side and only one on the other. Now here on re-entry, I managed to take it off of fine controls correctly, but you can see it's sort of turning towards Cape Canaveral. This isn't an S-turn. And that's where I went wrong. It's turning towards Cape Canaveral uh, in order to adjust its flight path, but it is doing an S-turn like that, right? Because it's turning, it's creating more drag. It's extending its flight path, and that means it's going to fall short. Uh, so I had to adjust that about this. So we're ending up landing like in Florida, a little bit past Tampa Bay. And I still have the problem where I was pitching down too quickly, so that also needs to be solved. But basically, I have since added a condition in the script whereby it doesn't try to turn towards Cape Canaveral unless it's going long. So basically, it'll be doing an S-turn in that case, but it won't try to make that turn unless it's got the ability to do so, unless it's got enough energy, if you will. So, yeah, adjustments need to be made. Here we have a safe touchdown in Florida, but not in the right part of Florida. It's a bit frustrating, every single version of KSP to have to redo the shuttle re-entry script for this reason and that reason. It was landing at Florida, at Cape Canaveral, in 1.1.3, eventually. And then I change versions and I have to redo everything. Go figure. And then 1.8.1 looks like I have to redo everything again too. So... Only on the re-entry though. The launch scripts always work. Launch scripts are nice. The mod here for the launch pad and all is real KSC. It's another reason why I've stuck to 1.3.1 instead of 1.8.1. I can't get this uh, displaying right in 1.8.1. It relies on Kerbal Constructs. Okay, booster separation. And off we go. 
As a bit of a side note, uh, recently I watched uh, some of Das Valdez's Twitch stream and he was interviewing Garrett Reisman. Garrett Reisman launched on STS-123 and came back on STS-124 on this shuttle mission. So we've covered uh, the two missions that brought Garrett Reisman to the space station. This particular mission was commanded by Mark Kelly, also uh, fairly prominent these days. Currently running for Senate in Arizona. So, Gem Pressurized Module is actually one of the larger things the shuttle brought to the station. I think it might be the largest thing. It's very heavy. You can see physically it takes up quite a lot of the bay. As we approach. Also a little bit cumbersome for the little tugs to handle, incidentally. One of the improvements I eventually made to my hand-designed Canada tugs is that they have extendable RCS ports to get better leverage, of course. These have the RCS ports a little bit too close to the body. Okay, and the whole docking situation. I really should have, like, checked out the time I actually take on these dockings. They are very peculiar dockings, but it'd be good to see if my time was actually going down and I was getting faster during each attempt. I would like that to be the case. But here we are, we have to convince the docking ports to actually mesh together. Come on. Uh, we have to roll a little bit, roll. Just a little. Again though, if you roll, it can throw another axis off if you're too abrupt. Okay, and then the tugs go and pull that huge module out. That is huge. It weighs in at about 17 tons. So I think it was the largest thing that was brought to the space station. A few other accuracy points. STS-123 launched and landed at night. So I did it at daytime, but that's not correct. That was a night launch and also a night landing. Well, the fact that it didn't quite land at Cape Canaveral also busted that one. On this mission, uh, the gem module was supposed to have a manipulator system, basically its own little arm, and I don't have that here. So we're missing the arm that was supposed to be part of this. So we are supposed to have another arm on the station, and there's another arm on Rasfit, I think. So there are a few arms floating about. Okay, here we go, docking this module, and then we'll move the experiment logistics module uh, to the top of it. Which oddly enough uh, means going around here. Maybe I should have uh, parked this experiment logistics module on the opposite side. Maybe I got the wrong side here. Oh, and uh, actually this time I've got the shuttle the wrong way around. Okay. We've got that experiment logistics module. I think these parts are from CX Aerospace. And uh, sort of the more complicated textured ones are from the Community ISS mod. The shadows are really doing a number. Okay, here we go. Hopefully I've got it rotated right. And docked. Alright, so that is done. And the drones will go back into the bay. Canada drones, Canada tugs, whatever you would like to call them. And a puffing in the cargo bay. Well, it'll be alright. Okay, so we've got those back. We depart. And in the next video, we'll finally uh, bring up the final truss. And that will be good to see. Unfortunately, as of this video, I had not started to solve my re-entry problems, so you know what's going to happen here, basically. If we were perfectly in line with Cape Canaveral, it'd get there. That That's sort of the problem here. Uh, I didn't realize exactly what was going on because as long as I got in line with Cape Canaveral, it get there properly, right? So sometimes it works, sometimes it wouldn't. 
and so figuring out why sometimes it doesn't was a trick. And you can see the way it's turning here and that should tell you exactly what's going to happen. It's going to fall short. And indeed it does. So here again we're pitching down too early. And so we also know that it's going to spin out because the vertical stabilizer is not going to have enough yaw control. It's just coming in too fast at this altitude. The heat effects aren't a particularly good indicator of this, by the way. The heat effects happen no matter what. Uh, so even if it's a safe velocity, uh, it would still get the heat effects. So anyway, we have learned. We point down to prograde vector and try to pull up. I have to admit that it does create some excitement during the stream, though it's not very satisfying to be honest. It does also lead to awkward questions about whether the shuttle would have survived the splashdown. So yeah. So here we go. I'm pulling up with reasonable might, uh, not a whole lot. Uh, it's still got some pitch range that I'm not using, so just smoothly pulling up here, trying not to pull too many G's. And finally, riding to the splashdown. And it just keeps going. Well, this is why it doesn't break apart, right? Uh, because it's just sort of gliding along. The shuttle probably wouldn't have broken apart, but the G-force on impact with the water would have probably killed the crew. So, uh, and lots of tiles would be gone. Anyway, so with that, uh, I will try and get the next videos to you as soon as possible. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.